you sleeping well? And is the sound of my voice enough? You know, is my favor over your life enough? You know, what if there is what what if there is nothing more? You know, what if uh You know, what if there what if there's not like some big ministry platform or what if there's no going back to, you know, what you do for a living and it's just the sound of my voice telling you that I love you. Is it going to be enough? Cuz that's, you know, when you're when you're in that situation and again it's like man you're you're looking around and you're seeing what everybody else has and god well why would you bless them with that and not me you know you start questioning you start questioning things like you know am i am i doing this right god is my you know is my heart cry of you know teach me how to love you teach me how to receive your love is my heart not right? Because it, it seems like everybody else is getting the blessings except me. The blessings that I'm getting are food and good sleep. And a few, you know, new forming relationships. Whereas, man, I really haven't haven't had a whole lot of friends in my life. You know, like I said, like it was pretty pretty focused on career there for a long time and I, you know, things got pretty dark for me so, you know not a lot of friends but all of a sudden I've got you know, these relationships for me and you start, you know, I start seeing like okay there is that but I don't, you know I'm in Missouri and it's the end of September it's going to be cold soon the kind of cold that'll kill you and I'm in this church and I don't want to I don't want to be a part of you know American religion I don't want to be a part of like the structure of it you know and so I'm looking around and I'm I'm noticing like all of the the usual suspects of religion and I just feel like maybe I've, you know, maybe I've failed and maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. You know, because the, the thing is, you tend to forget the provision. You know, when you get provision, you know, God clearly carried me to this place, you know. And we had a great trip together, you know, like I heard the voice of God on the way. But you tend to forget all that stuff when, you know, when it feels like the screws are being put to you. Here I am, sleeping outside, which I, I actually enjoyed. But reality sets in after a while, like, hey, you know, I need a house and a wife and kids and all that stuff. And learning to learning to receive from God, it's like... You can either go out and use your own effort, or you can trust God for it. Uh, but it's not a combination of the two, you know. Um, in that time, I had so many questions, and the desire to go and ask somebody else what the answer was was always something I had to fight and repent of. It's in our nature to want to rely on somebody else's relationship with God as a method to um, to gain guidance in our own relationship with God. But you can, you know, if you if you need a prophet, if you need a pastor to tell you what God's trying to tell you, that's a clear indication that you you aren't you haven't arrived in the place where you can hear it for yourself. And I'm not saying don't listen to prophets and don't listen to pastors. That's not at all what I'm saying. Like there's a there there's a need for for that. There's a need for all of the you know pastors, prophets, apostles, teachers, whatever. There's a need for that. You have to, you have to have that because you're never as long as you're 
a human being, you're never going to arrive at that place where you no longer need it. But training yourself, you know, to rely on on God and to cry out to God and say, God, I, I need to hear this from you. There's not, there, there's a lot of questions in life where you, you just, you may not ask anybody. You know, there's, there's very real, you know, questions like, well, God, why did you let my brother get murdered? You know, that's actually a, that's actually a valid question that I asked God and I got the answer to it. I needed the answer, and I got it. And had somebody, if, if a human being tried to explain that to me, it wouldn't have made sense. You know? There's a lot of questions like that. Why does God let, you know, children die of AIDS in Africa? I mean, that's, that's actually a valid question. You want to know the answer to it? You have to ask God. Because if you listen to some professor or priest, it's just going to piss you off. You know? Those are cosmically important questions and you actually need the answer to it there's a lot of people that say well don't question God no I, God wants you to bring your questions to him and sometimes it takes months of praying and months of crying out sometimes it takes moments you know I, I don't know the answer but uh, I'm just in that place again where I here I am, in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by people who, eh, they're not rude, but they're not exactly, you know, uh, they haven't exactly welcomed me with open arms, you know, and I don't want to be there. I just want to keep walking and, uh, you know, live in that place where I'm just praying all the time and, and receiving God's provision. It was awesome, and I, I missed it. And I just, here's God again saying, hey, I'm present here. I'm doing something here. And I've brought, I've brought you here, and I'll tell you when you can leave. We're going we're gonna to learn lessons. And time goes on, and there's, man, there's just crazy stuff happening. There was this one... <laughs> Just tell you a quick, you want to hear like the, you know, the miracle stories or whatever. Like, so this is a story about like my first exorcism. It's pretty crazy. There's this kid. He's actually, he's, he's a buddy of mine now. But he had this, it was weird. He, he, he was prone to throw temper tantrums. And nobody really wanted to hang out with him because of it. You know, like he, he, he threw temper tantrums. And he, and, he, and he threw this one temper tantrum and then stormed off. And then he had called us and on the phone and was sending texts saying he was going to kill himself and whatever. And it was just like that attention grab, like, oh, look at me. I'm in so much pain. I'm going to kill myself. And, and was, <laughs> long story, he, conv he convinced us that he had crashed his car and we had to go out and help him get his car out. And then it didn't turn out to be that way. It was just like this whole production. And I could tell because this is something that my brothers had to cast off of me at one point. It was embarrassing. You know? <laughs> I'll tell that story another time. But this kid had this spirit of narcissism on him. You know? And narcissism is funny. You know, that's a demon that almost everybody has on them. Narcissism, that self-love, like, you know, I'm so, you know... I'm so holy. I've got it all figured out. There's, there's also another side to, to narcissism. It's, I'm the ugliest person in the world. I'm the worst person in the world. Only I'm the number one ugliest, worst person in the world. It's narcissism. And it needs to be cast out. And usually you can do it just by calling it by name. You know? And so... But this kid, uh, he's showing all the classic symptoms of it. And after this long night of just all of this bizarre behavior, he, he shows back up and uh, he sits down. And I say, well, here's, 
here's here's what you're struggling with. You you, you have a spirit of narcissism. Excuse me, narcissism. It's a demon, and it's got to go. And here, let me explain the gospel to you. You know, <laughs> Jesus said, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." What that means is that you actually live in the kingdom of darkness, and you're being governed by it. You know, and like, and I'm just preaching the gospel over him, lovingly. And he's like, "Well, I just want somebody to pray for me." Here's another. This is this is one of the funny, the funny tricks of the enemy. So many people nowadays, when they get in pain, you know, if they're uncomfortable or if there's something that they can't figure out in their life, they want to run and have somebody pray over them because of some of the teaching that's gone on in the church for a very long time. A misinterpretation of Scripture, you know, what it actually means. But he was doing that. He's like, well, would you guys just pray for me? And I said, no, absolutely not. We're not going to pray for you, you know. And it was funny to watch his response to that because he'd never heard anything like that before. And the guys that were sitting at the table, they had never heard anything like that before either. You know, like, what do you mean we're not going to pray for him? We're supposed to pray for one another. It's like, yeah, we are we are supposed to pray for one another. But mostly, like, you're supposed to learn how to talk to God on your own. You, know? <laughs> like, you can't go to somebody else and have them uh, intercede for you on stuff that you need to go to God with yourself. You know, you have to sort it out. And I'm preaching the gospel over him, and he starts manifesting. He's, like, giving me, like, the, you know, the screw face, and, like, um, you know, he starts uh, shaking uncontrollably and weeping. Like, just all this manifestation starts coming out, and I'm just like, whoa, this is, like, an actual exorcism like the dude is you know trembling and shaking and he can barely speak and like and you know I just continue to to speak Jesus over him you know speak freedom over him and I was like yeah you know we're you know we are going to pray for you but you're not going to be here for it you need to go home and you need to cry out to Jesus that's that's what we do we cry out to Jesus this is the whole thing this is you know uh, and you need to go learn that. And you, you'll cry out to him, and here's what to expect. You're going to cry out to him, and then in, in that moment, you're going to feel like this tremendous peace, and it's going to go away in like 10 seconds. And then you need to cry out to him again, and then you'll get the peace again. And then it'll go away in like 30 seconds. And then you cry out to him again. And you keep doing that, you know, until... And that's how you learn how to cry out to Jesus. You just keep crying out. And when that when that sense of peace goes away, you cry out again. And he went away. And we didn't see him again for weeks. And he shows back up and he's all better. <laughs> he was like, yeah, man, I was really angry with you, man, for a long time. But, man, you know what? Thank you. And now he's my friend, you know? Like, he was the guy that gave me a ride out of town when I... When I finally got the call to leave again you know he's a buddy of mine like I'll know that guy until I till I die I imagine and that was that you know that was a crazy that was a crazy thing like I, I had learned that because that too was like something that my brothers had to sit me down and explain to me at one time and it was very uncomfortable and it was embarrassing it's embarrassing to have you know when you're walking around in the pursuit of Jesus to have your brothers in Christ tell you, hey, you got a demon influencing you. We're going to cast it off. What? What do you mean? Well, you're a narcissist. Oh, well, you know, I mean, your your mouth goes dry. Like, you start, you know, it's it's very uncomfortable. And my brothers had to had to endure that you know, with me. And it's all better, you know, like it's, it's all better. And, you know, going through that and seeing that, like, oh, that's why I had to go through that so that I can now minister to this kid because I can see it. I'm familiar with this demon. I can see it. 
I know what it is. I know, I know its name. And I know how to cast it out. And that's, you know, that may be a pretty weak um, example of an exorcism, but that's what it was. Now that demon's gone, and that kid is armed against it when it comes talking again. And here's the thing. This is kind of what I was getting at at the end of that last uh, uh, recording. Is that, like, when you're in that place and it's like, man, I'm in my little, you know, sleeping outside. It's the, you know, little camp thing that I've set up. You get, you get these thoughts like, man, God's never going to bless me. He's never going to give me all the good things I want. He'll let, he'll let the idiots have them. And it seems really unfair. See, this is even hard to say because these are all, everything I'm saying right now, it's all lies of the enemy and I don't like to repeat them. But these are thoughts that I know that you have too. If you're listening to this, I know that you have these thoughts. And you know how I know that? Because my experiences are not unique. And neither are yours. We all feel the same way. Like we all go through the same stuff. You know what I mean? It just seems unique to you. And that's why you have those thoughts of like, well, why does that guy get to have the blessing and I don't? Why is God being more favorable to that person? Who the hell do they think they are anyways? You know, that that kind of thoughts. Those are actually um, not your thoughts. It only seems like it. It seems like it because it it's it, it sounds like it's originating in your head. You know, like when you have earphones on? And you close your eyes and it sound it like the way the sound like it's it sounds like the music is literally in the center of your brain. When it's not, it's actually coming from the microphones. Demons talk that way. They lie that way. They speak lies over you and over you and it seems like it's your own thought, but it's not. It's lies. Anytime where you're looking over at somebody else and feeling envious, and you're feeling like God's not going to give you some good thing that you want, and you feel bad in your body, that's because the the liars are talking to you. And you're believing things that aren't true. And you're thinking things that aren't true. And that's why it feels bad, is because it's not the truth. That's why you can feel it in your body. Your physical body actually has a response to spiritual influence. And it's very natural. It's very common, you know. Shoulder, you know, shoulders slumped over, back pain, tiredness, fatigue, you know what I mean? Like all that stuff, it's like it it all ties in. And so I'm learning that as as I'm outside, you know, living outside, seeing the winter coming to Missouri in the foreseeable future. And thinking, God, did you bring me here to kill me in a Missouri winter? You know, is this is this the final stop? You know, is this is this the end of the story? Like all that stuff is literally going through my head, and it's demonic. You know? None of that stuff is true, and it's completely against everything I had just learned on the journey so far. You know, and God starts teaching me, like, dude. When you feel this way, just understand that's actually not your thought. You're not actually thinking that. It's being lied into you. And you need to you need to learn to cry out to me to remove the bad guys and hear the truth. And hear me speaking favor over your life. Oh wow. You know? Wow. Like so when I feel this way. When I feel like I'm just going to be a 38-year-old loser who dies in a you know Missouri winter because he went crazy and walked across the United States, like I need to stop thinking that way and focus on the throne and cry out to my Father to come and save me. Come and save me from these thoughts. Jesus, come save me. And then five minutes later when it comes back, Jesus... You died so that I wouldn't have to be subjected to this nonsense. Come and save me again. Come save me. I'm in danger. 
I'm being influenced by lies. Come save me. That's what salvation is. It means you're in trouble and somebody comes and rescues you. Come save me. So I learned that in, in that place. And that's actually just kind of hitting me right now. Like the reason, the reason I had to go through that, you know, to go through that period of like, well, what if, what if this is, what if the only thing is my voice? Hearing the God of the universe speaking, would it be enough for you? Like the lesson was, you need to make hearing my voice the only priority in your life. It's the only thing that's important. Because there's so many influences of, there's spiritual beings called demons, and their job is to lie, and they are everywhere. They're not omnipresent, they're just, they've got a lot of them. You know, and they're constantly speaking into people. Like you want to see, you want to see a good um, example of um, demons lying uh, played out to the fullest extent. You can go to just about any church uh, in America, but in particularly Southern California, because that's where I'm from. So I imagine this is the same all over America. Um, young women literally dressed up like prostitutes used to dress before it became fashionable. Right? That, that the lies of the enemy have so convinced uh, people in America that women need to be sexually provocative at all times in order to get what they want out of life. That's a lie from a network of beings that are not human. Okay? They're, they're, they're spiritual beings and they speak lies. And that's the effect. That's the, that's the end result. Is They've been lying to women They've been lying to men about women, and now that's what we have. A bunch of people who walk around in the belief, because it, it seems to them that, that, that it was their idea all along. And it's not. It's not their idea. They've, they've been lied to. And we need to have compassion on them for that and approach that, you know, strategically and full of compassion. So anyways, I'm in this I'm in this place where I'm learning that. I'm learning like, oh, okay, so those voices that tell me that God's never going to give me anything that's good, you know, and that I'm going to be walking around, you know, on the edge of feeling embarrassed about my walk with Jesus, you know, um, with that feeling like I need to explain myself to everybody what I'm doing and who I am and what I'm really capable of in the world. You know, it's all lies, and God is teaching me all that stuff. Don't explain, man. Don't explain yourself to people. You know, if you like, I noticed that too. Like, people would ask me, you know, questions like, "Well, are you gonna go get a job? Are you gonna go, you know, do this or whatever?" Like, I would, I would start pulling out the resume. Like, listen, like, I used to make a lot of money, and I used to be a commodity trader. All right, a futures trader. And don't look at me like I'm some kind of loser because I'm smarter than you. And I've made it further in life than you. You know, is basically what I was communicating to these people. And God started checking me on that. He's like, hey, number one, you don't owe anybody an ex explanation. This is you and me. Number two, you still think you're pretty cool. You know? You're still hanging on to who you wanted to be in the world. Why are you doing that? Because, yeah, like, like those things are true. I made a lot of money, but believe me, like I'm not, trust me, I'm not bragging. 
I was miserable the whole time. You know, I'm not bragging about what I had accomplished because I didn't accomplish anything. I was miserable. I was miserable, and I made everybody around me miserable with it. You know? So forgive me if that sounded braggadocious. Uh, learning to block those thoughts to take every thought captive and be like okay here's what's going on I'm being lied to I'm not going to listen to that I'm going to cry out to Jesus and find out what he has to say about this matter and I was learning that the hard way This whole time, there was, it's an interesting story, you know, because this is, this is a story about my repenting from being critical of religious people. Church people, you know, you know, the enemy, you know, the, the people that were responsible for hurting me. The people that were responsible for letting me down in San Diego, well, now it's everybody in America. To, to, to the degree that if, if you and I were to have a conversation and you would identify yourself as a Christian, my immediate thought, without pause, would be suspicion. And to doubt what you were saying. Simply because you identified yourself that way. Literally. That's like I'm not even in, I'm not even exaggerating. That would literally be my response. You tell me you're a Christian and I would doubt you. And I would judge you and you know based on years of pain and bad examples and you know that's who I was, that's what I had become. And me and my buddy uh, Josh, my, uh, Josh McKendrick, that I met there, he was in the same boat. Only he was just getting into the ring. Like I had, I'd been boxing for a while with these with these concepts. He was just getting into the ring. You know, he was basically me the year before. And so he's got all of the same things. And it's almost like God put him into my life so I could see what I looked like when I was doing these horrible things. Because this kid, that don't give, this, this kid's like my best friend now. I, I love him to my soul. You know what I mean? I love this kid. But <laughs> to listen to him talk about these Christians that we're now surrounded with, like, made me physically ill. Because he's constantly complaining about the phony balloon. Like, we'd sit in this coffee shop, and Christians would be sitting around like, you know how Christians talk? Like, oh, uh, what's your calling, brother? Oh, what's your calling, bro? Oh, I have a, I have a pastoral calling all my life. Like, like, anything but, like, you would hear anything but, I'm a worshiper. Like, God put me on this earth to worship him. The end. You never hear anything. It's always this, this, this prideful, arrogant. I have a pastoral call. I'm gonna be a worship leader. You know what I mean? Like I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a. Uh, this one lady says to me, she's like, "You have to be an ambassador. Like if you're a Christian, you have to be an ambassador." And I'm just like, "So, well, what about like the new guy, the guy, the guy that just got saved five minutes ago? Do you, do you trust him to be an ambassador?" Well. Uh, you know what I mean? Just like, just that whole people in the church in America will identify themselves as anything but what they, what their true calling is. You know, you are to be a worshiper with whatever it is that God gave you, whatever instrument that God gave you to worship him with, you are to be a worshiper with that instrument. Whatever that might be. Oh, you mean my pastoral instrument? No, 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 no. 
if you couldn't do it when you were four years old, you know, if you couldn't worship God with that, then, then it's not your instrument. You know what I mean? The thing that God gave you to worship Him, you've had it your entire life. It's not something that you graduate college from and then your your graduation present from God is this thing, you know? And so we would sit in this coffee shop and just listen to these these self-congratulatory conversations about Christian stuff, you know? And we're just sitting there, we're pulling our hair out, and, oh, God, please, I don't want to listen to this anymore. And he'd start talking, and... You know, at first, like, I would join in, like, yeah, gosh, I can't believe that God has me here, and I don't, I don't, you know, this really, these people are just as fake as anywhere else, and, you know, just that whole judgmental, critical pointing of the finger, you know, pointing the finger at these people going, you don't get it, you know, like, you don't understand, and here's, and here's actually, here's how you know that I'm truly confessing. This is, this actually happened, this, this is... This stuff came out of my mouth then that I had begun uh, saying, you you know, in my heart, but then it it, it finally kind of hit me once I had actually said it out loud. Like, I was looking at these people going, because they're, they're, let me qualify this statement. Their claim to fame is... um, follow Jesus with abandon, you know, abandon is the word, which we all need to do. This is, this is what we need to do. We need to abandon everything that we've, we've thought and just run after Jesus. Just drop everything, follow Jesus. Because if you truly believe that you cannot be disappointed, if your heart, mind, and soul is chasing after Jesus, then there's no reason for you to not drop everything, everything, and run after Jesus, right? So I'm in this environment, you know, we're in this environment. They're all college kids, you know what I mean? They're all that good-looking, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're um, you know, still concerned about uh, fashion. You know, they're, they're that crowd. And uh, they're all there with that same chant of like, oh, I'm following Jesus with abandon. And we're just looking at these kids like, all right, um, your parents, like you don't live at home anymore, but your parents are paying for everything. You know, <laughs> like you, you haven't abandoned anything. You're, you, you live because your parents are paying for your life, you know, like just cause you don't sleep in the same room you gl- grew up in doesn't mean you're, You've abandoned anything. Like you're, you are supported, and the people that don't get support from their parents, they 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 write letters to you know people that they know, and they say, "Hey, will you you know send me twenty bucks a month?" And then they do that, uh, and they try to get I don't know a hundred people to do that, and then they've got two thousand bucks a month so that they can pay their rent and, and whatever. But ultimately, they're getting they're getting donations. They're getting money from other people because they've asked for it. And it's like, okay, that's not abandoned. What I do is abandoned, right? This is what was coming out of my heart. What I do is abandoned. I'm the true follower of Jesus because I walked away from San Diego with a pack on my back. That was literally what was in my heart. And God showed that to me. That was not a good day. All right? That was a tough thing to hear from God. It was full of love. Because, again, like, for those of you that have heard the voice of God, you know. Like, even the harshest stuff he says, it's full of love and full of, hey, we're going to get over this, buddy, and I'm going to make you all better. But you got to confess it. You know, and that's a tough, that's a tough thing to admit that I had literally turned my homelessness, right, into an idol of pride. Isn't that that crazy? 
like as human beings, you need to understand this about yourself. Because again, let me turn this right back around on you so that you don't miss this. You will turn anything into a source of pride and worship it. You will. You do. You are. The human mind is an idle producing conveyor belt machine. We produce idols. That's that's that is our stock and trade. We produce idols to worship. And you'll you'll use anything. So here I am in this situation with God hitting me with, "Hey, you've turned your homelessness into a, sor- a source of pride, a source of putting yourself above other people." And I had to cry out about that. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, like... Like I'm the obedient child of God because I did something crazy that he asked me to do. You know? That's a lot... That's a lot of... It takes uh, it takes a great deal of energy to to morph homelessness into a source of pride, and I had done it. I had accomplished that, and I had to repent of that, you know. Because, like, I'm not, I don't ever want to suggest to anybody that in order to find the clear, open communication with God, that they need to go walk across their state or across the United States, or across Europe. Like, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I am telling you, though, and I'm not suggesting this, this is something that Jesus said, like, you must be on a journey. You know? If you feel like you're not on a journey, it's because you're not. And you need to be on, you need to be on the journey. You need to be on the path. The way. There is a way that leads to life, and few will find it. That scripture needs to scare you. It's a mathematical scripture. Few will find it. You you need to hear the voice of God, and you need to know that it's Him. You just got to ask Him, you know. Over and over and over again. He'll give you a little bit, and you got to ask again, and he'll give you some more, and you got to ask again, and he'll give you some more. So, anyways, me and Josh were sitting there, and that hits me like, "Oh wow, look what I've done! I've turned my, I've turned my humility into pride. That's amazing. Like it would be impressive if if it wasn't so impul- uh, repulsive." what I had done, you know. So now I'm sitting here with this kid and we're watching all of this crap going on, you know, all these all these self-righteous people, you know, and we're sitting there being self-righteous. We're one of them, you know. We've turned ourselves into one of them by joining their game, you know, the self-righteous game. And so finally, like, uh, I realized what was going on, took my business to God. I sat Josh down. I said, okay, all right, right, look, here's the thing. And God gave me this scripture, explained the whole thing to me. Isaiah 58. God says, you know, if you want to be able to call on my name and have me show up, and then he goes, you know what, better yet, if you want to call on my name and have me jump out and say, here I am, you need to stop pointing your finger at people and speaking vanity. That's in the book of Isaiah, and Jesus quoted it. You need to stop pointing your finger at people and speaking vanity. What do you mean speaking vanity? Speaking vanity. Saying that you know, you're more beautiful than they are. That's what vanity is. It's looking at yourself, admiring yourself. You need to stop pointing your finger at people 
and thinking that you're better than they are, you know, or that you know more, or that you're stronger, or that you're even weaker. You know what I mean? Like, you can't point your finger at people, religious people. They don't know. And we're, we all suffer from it. We're all religious. Like, if I have, look, if I have the capacity to do that, you have the capacity to do that. You know what I mean? If I am doing that, you are doing it. And this is something that we're going to, I imagine, I don't know, like, like maybe Mother Teresa doesn't, didn't deal with this towards the end of her life. I don't, I'm not sure. But it just seems to me like if you're, if you're, you know, as long as we're in these bodies, we're going to have to contend with that. We're, you have to keep your eye open for it. Because the, the, um, the drive to self-congratulate and, and exalt oneself is something that King David did right up until the very end. You know, Paul did it. Peter did it. You know, guys that literally walked with Jesus when he was here, they did it. You know what I mean? It, it seems like that that aspect, you know, that, that need to keep that in check and to continue to repent of it and to continue to cry out for the healing of it is something that that it looks like from my perspective goes on until until you're out of this flesh until the day of the lord you know until you're either in front of jesus because your body died and your spirit left your body or he comes back and gives you a new body i i don't know how it works all i'm saying is is like look if i'm if i'm sick with this you are sick with it And if you want to deny that, that's cool, but we can't hang out, you know? <laughs> like, like, if you're all better, then I need to stay down here with the sick people, you know, because you're all better. You're, you've been made whole, so you're not the one that Jesus came for, you know? <laughs> Jesus came for the sick, not for the whole. So if you're all well... And you don't struggle with any of this. You don't struggle with cri being critical of other people who have more than you do. Or being critical of people because they have less than you do. Or being critical of people because they don't see eye to eye with you. Like, that's, that's a sickness that I have. And you have it too. And if you're in denial of that, like, uh... You should really, you should really meditate on that because it's preventing you from having God pop out of the clouds and say, "Ta-da! Here I am." That's what we all want. We all want to be able to call on God and have Him show up like that. We all want that. Like if you're still listening to this, do you want that? You know what I mean? Because like you're, you, you're interested in in the story of Jesus in my life for some reason. So if you're listening to this, that tells me that you want that, you know. Here it says in Isaiah 58, if you want that, here's how it works. Stop pointing your finger at people and speak in vanity. That, that's it. Um and that was like that was the big lesson. And it seemed like that was kind of like the whole it tied back into my hatred for those people back in San Diego like I told you like that tied into all that stuff like God is saying remember when I told you that I was gonna I was gonna make you love those people this is part of it I've just showed you one of the major things and I had to drag you all the way out to Missouri because this is this is where the classroom for that lesson is I'm going to make you sit around a bunch of people that don't know you, you know. Like, this is going to be a sterile environment. These people don't know you. You don't know them. I'm just going to run a clinic here. I'm going to make you sit around a bunch of people who talk a bunch of religious nonsense. I'm going to make you endure that so that you can see clearly that you're critical of people. And that you point your finger at the sick. Wow, that just hit me. Revelation right in the moment. You point your finger at sick people and say, look at you, you're sick. 
You know? That's not what a physician does. That's not Jesus in my life. You know? So now it's it's all about me. And God purging me of my sickness. And saying, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to... It doesn't have anything to do with those other people. Like, I wasn't telling those other people that they were dumb. You know, I wasn't saying anything to them. It wasn't about them. God doesn't want you to hang out. With, he doesn't want you to be critical of other people because he wants you to be able to call on him and appear to you. He wants to have an open relationship with you. You will not have it if you're critical of other people. If you're listening to this and you're one of the people who don't like me, Back in San Diego, you know, like, if you're critical of me right now, I've got some bad news for you. You know? And if I'm critical of you when I get back, like, I'm, I'm far away right now, so, like, I'm not even really thinking about you. But sometimes I think, like, what would happen if God gave me, like, if I was sitting here, I'm in Miami right now. If I was sitting here and some dude walked through the door and gave me a plane ticket back, to San Diego and said, this is where God wants you to go. And if I went back there and God told me to go back to those people, like sometimes I think about that, like what, how would I treat those people? Like, do I have the love in my heart for them now? Because I don't think so, you know? Like the idea of going back to that place makes me cringe. Like, oh, I don't like those people and they don't like me. Why in the world would I hang out with them? You know? It just seems like a big, you know what I'm saying? Big waste of time. So I don't know. Like, I don't know how far I've come so far. I just know that this is the process. God will show you stuff. And when he does, like, you have to be courageous. And you have to be able to admit to him what the problem is. When he shows it to you, he says, okay, here's the problem. You're a prideful jerk. You have to be able to repeat that back to him. Copy that, Lord. Wow, I'm a prideful jerk. I'm sorry. And I can't fix it, Lord. Will you please come and heal me? You know? It takes courage to do that. Nobody wants to admit that they're the jerk in the situation. You know? Nobody wants that. But you have to. You know? I hear hear people in charismania... You know, the the whole prophetic movement thing in America right now, I hear, like, there's ministers that I hear speaking against, um, not the ones that are speaking against religion, because that's good, but speaking against, like, religious people and condemning religious people. Man, let me tell you something. Um, Jesus came in the flesh to a uh, monotheistic people to a religious people that's who Jesus came to I mean he ended up getting murdered by him but like that's who he came to you know if you're unwilling to go be murdered by religious people um, well good luck with that you know If you're unwilling to let God's heart melt your heart for people who've been bound in religion because that's what their parents taught them to do, you know, they don't know any better. Their parents taught them how to do that. And their parents before them taught them how to do that. And so on and so on and so on. You know, like you look at Ireland, like not so much anymore, but like, Catholics and Protestants used to kill one another in Ireland. Can you like not very long ago? Like there, there's still tension between Catholics and Protestants, literally killing one another. Isn't that crazy? Religion does that. Do you want to? You want to point your finger at the religious? Now again, I'm speaking this with authority because I. I got the victory. I've been to the battle and I won. God gave me the victory in this and is continuing to grant me victory in this every time it comes up. So I speak this with authority. If you want to point your finger at religious people and condemn them for what they've done, 
you are standing in direct opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the end of that one. I really hope you caught that too. Like, if that's you, like, you do not have the right to point your finger at anybody and think that you're better because of your position on Jesus. That's, let me go so far as to say this. What I just said is the word of God coming, proceeding from my lips. If you point your finger at religious people, Because you think you have a better angle on Jesus. You are standing in direct opposition to Jesus. Let me tell you something. The moment God no longer favors a life, it dies. (laughs) You know? If you have life, it's because God is granting it to you. Like if you have a pulse in your heart it's because God is maintaining that pulse when you speak against life like it puts you in a very dangerous spot you know and God will let you keep doing it like he'll keep he'll keep favoring your life and let you live because he's hoping that you, you know you'll come around He's not gonna. He's not gonna strike you dead, but you know, you're gonna get to heaven, and God's gonna. You know, He's Jesus is gonna look at you and be like, "Okay, so you you learned how to cast out demons. You even learned how to raise the dead. But man, you never let me control you. You never let me be one with you." Because you wanted to, you wanted to be in control. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. Wait a minute. These were, these were holy men standing before Jesus saying, hey, I figured out how to heal sickness. And I, fi- I figured out how to raise the dead. And I prophesied in your name. These were, that example in Revelations... Uh, uh, those were Christians, <laughs> right? Those were people professing Christ. They said, in your name. We did those things in your name. And Jesus said, yeah, but you wanted to be in control. I never knew you. I never had that term new. It's that, it's that same word that's the same word that's used for intercourse. It says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. You never laid down and let me have my way with you. The way of the Lord is peace. Right? And when you're pointing your finger at people, you're not at peace. When you're pissed off at the President of the United States or Congress, you're not at peace. Oh, but Pete, those people are worker of iniqui- workers of iniquity. Well, Paul said, uh, we are not to impute the wickedness of the wicked upon the wicked. You know what I mean? Like, that's not your job. If you're angry at anyone, you're not at peace. You're not at peace. I've literally, I've heard Christians say, oh, what about righteous indignation and, you know, Jesus turning the tables. All right. Let's talk about that for just a minute. God will allow me to delve into his anger, his wrath, when I have mastered his love, his tender mercy and his loving kindness. And until that day... I have no right to think that I can handle something as great and terrible as his disapproval. Same goes for you. And let me ask you a very ancient question, and this is something that I've had to answer, and I'm continued, you know, I continue to have to answer this question. 
It's a very old question. Do you think you do well to be angry? You think you being angry is pleasing to God? Do you think you do well to be angry? You're angry because your parents split up. So am I. You know? No, I was. Now I'm grateful. You know? You're angry because, you know, your your job blew up, the economy sucks, and you've lost your house. Are you angry? Are you angry about that? Disappointed, angry at God? Do you think you do well to be angry? How could this happen to me? Do you think you do well to be angry? Because you don't. You don't do well to be angry. You do well to cry out to Jesus. And ask him, what does this all mean? And Jesus, I'm, I'm full of emotions right now and I can't help it. Can you please come to this situation? I can't make heads or tails out of any of this. And I'm very angry. Can you please come and make me not angry? And he'll come and do it. So I'm learning all of this stuff in this place. And I really hope that this is like resonating with somebody. You know, having God show you like, man, you've just turned your homelessness into a source of pride. Wow. <laughs> you know? And, and learning, like, man, I, I'm telling you, my little campsite in this construction site, it was like, a, it was like a, the start of a basement. You know, like they put up the concrete and then they left the job site. And I just had, like, this empty, uncovered basement that I was sleeping in. And it was beautiful. I could sleep under the stars and there was no, you know, like, there was no bugs or anything to worry about. And there was, like, I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be deer, like, you know, <laughs> right in front of me. Oh, dear. And, um, but I was crying out, you know, like, God, what is, you know, what's, what's going to happen to me? Like, what are you going to, what are you going to do with me? Am I going to die here? You know, like, why do I have to go through all this? And he's teaching me all of this stuff. And it was like I wasn't content with the lessons, that that's what I was there to do, was to learn these lessons. And it's like I wasn't content with it. And I didn't realize, like, fully at the time that I was learning those lessons, that that, in fact, was the voice of God. Learning those lessons and being brought in my mind to those conclusions, that that's the voice of God. It didn't seem that way at the time. It seemed like God wasn't talking to me. I remember standing there in that in that basement just one night, like I was just praying, like, God, I really need to hear like your audible voice right now. I need to hear from you that this is exactly where you want me to be because I'm miserable right now and I'm scared and nobody likes me and I don't have any money and I'm stuck in Missouri, you know, like like God you really need to speak out loud to me right now and tell me that this is exactly where you want me to be. And I was just like, please. Like, I was like, not chanting it, but just saying it over again. Like, God, please, please come, please, please tell me that this is, that you approve of me and this is where you want me to be and that I am in, in your will. I need to know that from you right now. Please. I'm scared, you know. And then I got the peace. Peace. Like when you feel a physical shift, like when you go from like full of anxiety to absolute peace in an instant, <laughs> that's your confirmation. You know, that's God. God does that. And uh, going through all of this, 
looking around and just watching, you know, watching this place that, you know, God has